Good afternoon, everyone, and assalamu alaikum to everyone who has joined us today. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Omer Bashir, and I'm an educational advisor based in the Karachi office. We have prepared a great session for you. We will discuss a variety of things, such as how to research for graduate programs, factor to consider while researching, and much more, followed by Q&A session towards the end. For everyone who, is, who are engaging with us for the first time, just a brief in introduction on who we are. Education USA in Pakistan is part of the US Department of State Network of over 430 international student advising centers in more than 175 countries and territories. The network promotes US higher education to students around the world. Education USA in Pakistan is your official source of information on US higher education and offer free advising services. We also have an app now. You can use this chat with, uh, you can use this to chat with our advisor, dear advisors during work hours and to get event alerts. Also, you can access frequently asked questions on different topics and much more. So uh, before we start, please take a moment and drop your comments in the chat box and share why would you like to study in the United States. For me personally, it was the quality of education and the recognitions of degree across the world. Uh, so why study in the US recognitions, of course, degrees from the United States are recognized everywhere in the world. And the quality is the greatest and it's on the top of the programs in the world. Each campus and university in the United States is pretty diverse, meaning that every campus you step into, you will meet people from different types of background and culture. Uh, there is a flexibility option in the US as well, meaning that once you're in your program, you're more than welcome to take electives and you're also, you can also minor in some of the universities. And then there's also student life where you can join a lot of clubs if you're a Pakistani student and if there are Pakistani students in the university, there should be <clears throat> there should be a Pakistani club as well where you can join and you can arrange for a lot of events. And then lastly, US is pretty generous when it comes to funding uh, compared to other countries. If you research the college application process, it can be a bit daunting. College USA, uh, Education USA has broken down the US college application process into five simple steps and our advisors help with all five of these steps. But today we will be primarily talking ab about researching your options as there are more than 4,000 universities in the US. So before we begin, I would like to elaborate on what is a graduate student <clears throat> in the US. A graduate student in the United States is someone who is trying to pursue their master's or PhD level coursework and have obtained a bachelor's degree, which is also called undergraduate in the United States. So when it comes to graduate degrees, there are different programs in the US. Uh, you can get your master's, you can get your professional master's. After you have completed your master's, you can get PhD or DBA. Uh, on So let's talk about a little bit about master's degree. Master's degree is typically about two to three years, sometimes less depending on the program you're getting into. And master's is also major focus, meaning that you know what type of degree you're going to get into. Let's take business as an example. Uh, if you're trying to get into business, you will, you will have different types of concentration. Personally, I have my concentration was management. So this was something that was major oriented. Also getting into a master's program in the US, most of the universities have GPA requirement and that is 3.0. Then there's also professional masters, which emphasizes on technical training and the development of demand business and leadership skills. Learners are able to apply those uh, into their jobs as to pursue their degree as well. Just keep in mind as an international student, you should uh, know that U.S. professional accreditation, accreditation won't necessarily be recognized overseas. 
Moving on to PhD, PhD is research focused. Typically it takes about three to five years. Sometimes it can take longer. It just depends on your program. Sometimes it can also take you six years as well. When getting into a PhD program, some PS universities don't really have a minimum GPA requirement. However, they're going to look at your undergraduate uh, degree, coursework, how you performed in it, and your, grad your master's degree coursework, how you performed in those. And then it varies. Lastly, DBA is a combination of classes and applied research work. The DBA teaches you to apply theories and knowledge in order to improve. Professional practice, the first year of DBA are generally dedicated to class attending and review of literature in relation with the research topic. The following years are dedicated to writing of thesis and applications. So now, how to research for graduate programs. So this is where the main thing comes, identifying major and area of research. You would have to know what where, what are you trying to major in and what your research is going to be based upon because PhD is all about research. And then do you need a graduate degree? There are a lot of majors out there that don't really require to have your advanced degree, such as engineering. When you apply for engineering jobs, they're going to look at, of course, your basic requirement, which is going to be your bachelor's degree and how much work experience you have in the past. On the other hand, if you are a business major, your work experience would count and as well as your ex, uh, as well as your education would count. And then location is also one of the other factor. Where would you like to go in the US and stay? And we will touch more basis upon location on the very next slide. Another thing that I would like to clear out today would be cost of attendance. So cost of attendance is different than cost of living. Cost of attendance is basically how much you're going to pay in your tuition and books and supplies. Cost of living is something where you have to pay for your rent and um, pay for your electricity bills, your home insurance, your other types of stuff, your foods and stuff like that. So let's take an example. If your cost of attendance at university for one year is 25,000 to 30,000, then you should add another 15 to 20,000 for your living expenses. And then commitment. How much are you committed to do this uh, degree program? Are you, okay, are you okay to travel abroad, leave your family? Are you, are you able to uh, travel and live in the United States? Would you miss your family? Personally, when I moved to the US, I was 14 years old and I had a hard time living without my family. However, I was very committed and I was able to achieve my higher education and I came back to Pakistan and I'm contributing to the economy. Then you need to ask yourself, what is your long-term and short-term goals? Of course, the both matter and they, go, they both go hand in hand. You have to plan for your long-term. The degree that you're planning to get in the US, is that worth it? When, when you come back, is it recognized? Of course it's recognized. Would you be able to land a good job at a certain amount of time? If you have taken any loans, would you be able to pay back? And if you are, how long will it take you to pay those loans back? And then public or private? We will talk more about public and private in the next uh, slide. Uh, so there, as like in Pakistan, there are public and private institution. US also has a concept of public and private institutions as well. So more factors to consider while you're researching school type, as I was mentioning in the previous slide about private and public. Private universities are funded by endowments. Basically, that means there are a lot of donations that those schools receive, and they are smaller in size, and student and professor ratio is pretty smaller as well. So, and it's also very competitive. Public universities are very open and they're very big in size and they're very diverse as well. Another thing that will, uh, another factor would be letter of recommendation. Letter of recommendations would be required for you to get into the master's and PhD level. What letter of recommendation would really matter when you're trying to get into a PhD level, coursework. And then funding, uh, you would have to see the total cost of attendance and living costs, are you able to afford it? If, uh, if you're not able to afford part of it, see if, you're, if there are some scholarships available you can apply for. Location, 
is also another factor because some parts of the United States are extremely cold, some are extremely hot, and some are just moderate. So this is something you would need to consider. Where do you think yourself living? Are you able to bear the snow? New up north, like New York, Boston, Washington, it snows a lot. Up down south, like Texas, it's extremely hot. So this is something, another thing that you would need to take into account when you are researching for schools. Also, acceptance rates rate would also matter because some universities have a very high denying rate for students, but some universities take a lot of students. And then also you would have to see if your uh, major is also offered at that particular university. If that university is offering engineering, if that's your choice, if they're offering business, if that's your choice. And lastly, faculty profile and area of research matters a lot when you're applying for PhD because you're working with this faculty and you will be doing a lot of work under this faculty. So you would want to know what that faculty member has done in the past and what they have published. So more factors. The deadline is the deadlines are very important to note. If you miss if you miss these deadlines, it's very hard to appeal them. So one of the deadlines would be school application. You would need to know when or when is the deadline to apply for fall semester. When is the deadline to apply for the spring semester? Also, you would also want to note deadline for scholarships because they have different deadlines. Also for fellowships and assistantship, they all have different deadlines. And we'll talk more about fellowships and assistantship in, in later slides. Uh, more factors would be essay writing, your personal statement, which is your statement of purpose. Schools look at that statement very closely these days since it's getting highly competitive. And if you're applying for any scholarship, they would a lot of scholarship would want you to write an essay. Like why should they choose you among other students? What makes you stand out against others? And then another factor would be housing. If you are planning to live off campus or on campus, off campus meaning if you have family, you can live with them. Or if you're going to rent an apartment, you can live in your apartment. On other hand, on campus, meaning that you are living in dorms, which is also considered hostels. So if you're planning to live on campus, you would also need to apply for on campus living. And then there is also deadlines, how soon or how late you can apply. And then sometimes there are application fees for these kind of applications. Some more factors to reconsider would be extracurricular activities, which would be your volunteer work, your, which is community service and student government involvement. A lot of schools do look at this. And then once when you're researching for your schools, you can look at the career services website as well and see what type of internships they're offering. Internships usually are paid or unpaid. You don't have to aim for paid internships all the time. You can also do unpaid. Also, when you're looking for schools, uh, you can all, since F1 students are not allowed to work on campus, so there are a lot of on-campus employment opportunities available. Just keep this in mind that this is not going to pay for your tuition. This is going to barely help you with your food or partially with rent. And then also financial aid is something you would want to know if the school is generous with their funding or not. So at this point, you have done your preliminary research and you have sense of your financial profile, and then we can start building a list of your school. V advisors recommend students having dream list, target list, and safety list for the school. At a graduate level, you can shortlist at least eight, eight schools, and then within that eight, you would have to do more research and come down to five schools. And then among those five schools, one would be your dream school, let's take Harvard as an example, if you want to go into Harvard, but we know it's highly competitive, but it's your dream to go there. So you can prepare and even apply there. And then there will be one school that you, you want to target it really. Let's take MIT as an example. And you really want to target that school because of the faculty research that they have and the publications and the funding that they offer to international students you can target one school. And then you would want to have three safe to school, which you are certain that you will get into these kind of schools. Like these, these, schools, these schools will definitely take you in. So this is a balanced, uh, balanced sheet for you to have. 
So if let's say you are really interested in that school and you want to stay in that school, you can take a virtual campus tour. Like you can imagine yourself being there because you're ha you have to spend the rest of your life about four to six years of your life there. So you, do, you can picture yourself there by taking the virtual campus tour. And these are the websites. So after you have done all your research, now you are trying to narrow down which school you want to go to. So some things, some strategies to narrowing it down. Ask yourself, what is important to you? You don't have to get into social pressure. You just ask yourself, what are you trying to do? What is important to you? What do you want to do with this degree? What do you want to do in long run? And then if you're more confused, you can start drafting, your, like you can start writing a freehand essay. You can title it, why this college? You can start writing it down. Don't worry about grammar. Don't worry about spelling. Don't worry about any type of typos. Just write it down as long as it makes it sense to you. That's great. By the end, you would know that, okay, this is the school why I really want to go to once you read them. And then rank qualities by importance. Like, again, what is important to you? Don't get into society pressure because a lot of things, a lot of people said different things, but what is what is important to you? You should act upon it. So when planning for graduate school, we advise students to start 12 to 18 months in advance because it's a long process. So in that period of time, within 18 months, start looking for schools and what type of testing they're requiring and start registering for those testing. And then 12 to 14 months in advance, choose the institution of the interest and see what type of applications you have to fill out. And then 12 months in advance, identify who is going to write letter of recommendations. And we will talk more about letter of recommendation in the next slides. And then request a transcript from all the schools that you have attended because institutions like to see your grades when you, are, when you are at the graduate level. And then also make sure by 12 months, the entrance, like whatever GRE, TOEFL, whatever the school is requiring, you have those scores and they're above average. And then by 11 months in advance, confirm all the information that the school needs you have it gathered correctly. And then you can start applying 10 months in advance. You can start applying for schools and then by between 10 to three months, you will start receiving your decisions. So three months in advance before you depart to the US, you can start applying for student visa. You can also schedule pre-departure orientation with Education USA, just to keep something to keep in mind that we do not assist students in applying for student visa. However, we can guide you on how to interview at the consulate. So when you are at a graduate level, uh, you are welcome to get assistantship and fellowship. Assistantship is something that you would be working with professors and uh, you would be doing office work as well. And this is done at the master's level. And this would either give you a tuition waiver, your whole tuition is not going to be waived. It's highly competitive. Sometimes it is waived, depending on your grades and your test scores. And then there's fellowship. This is something you do it, mostly fellowships are done at the doctoral level where you're doing research and you're helping, you're actually teaching classes. And fellowships could be done either part-time or full-time, but usually for F1 students, it's full-time. So different types of assistantship that is offered in the US. So there's teaching and research assistantship. So in teaching assistantship, you are basically preparing material for the professor to teach in the class. And you're also grading the coursework, such as their homework, they're, you're grading their midterms, you're grading their exams, and they're posting their exam grades in the student portal. And then in the research assistant type, you're assisting professors how to conduct how to conduct a research. You're helping them getting content from different websites. And then you're also helping professors formatting their papers to publish. So, so there, there are some strategies to get assistance at master's level. You need to be enrolled in a graduate program, of course, and you need to have a 3.0 GPA. There's no appealing in this. Uh, this is set at most of the US universities that you need to have both of these requirements. And then previous work experience is also a plus on your application and letter of recommendations are going to also help you. In order to apply for these assistantship, make sure that you have a cover letter and a well-prepared resume. 
almost in every job in the United States that you're going to apply, they're going to ask for cover letter. And cover letter is not going to be the same for each job that you apply for. It's going to be different depending on the job description and the company. So this slide is dominantly for students applying for PhD in the US. So when you're applying for a PhD in the US, your statement of purpose is extremely important. It's a very important component of your applications. Universities are looking for evidence that applicant understands the nature of PhD program, and they can articulate scholarly intentions that fit with the current research interests of current faculty, and it is academically prepared to successfully undertake the quantitative demands of the program. This is, in many ways, the most important aspect of your application. Uh, as personally, I have worked as an academic advisor in the United States, and I was over the engineering academy between Houston Community College and United, University of Houston, Victoria. And they were launching engineering academy, and I was the admitting advisor. I would just make sure the student has applied, and the second thing I would look at would be their statement of purpose. A lot of students get rejected for admissions because their statement of purpose is just very generic or it's poorly written or it's just not what the school is accept, uh, wanting or asking for. Another thing is publishing. A lot of students are confused. Should we have published work before applying for PhD? So this varies school to school, right? In the United States, there are 4,000 universities. They all have their requirements. Mostly, publishing is not required. However, it's highly encouraged. PhD itself, the whole coursework is going to teach you how to research and publish your papers. And then a lot of students are confused about professional experience. They, should you have professional experience to apply for a PhD program in the United States? This depends on your major. What type of major are you applying for? But most of the majors don't really require professional experience. But again, you just have to be very careful which major you're choosing. Then comes letter of recommendations. These letters of recommendations are written by your ed school advisors. These are written by your professors. These are written by your employers. So it is very important to have good connections and relationship with these people because they're going to help you long-term giving these letters. Then comes testing. So a lot of students have asked if testing is required for PhD program. Yes, uh, after then during COVID, a lot of schools went test optional, but they're coming, they're reverting back their policies where for PhD, you have to test. For masters, a lot of students are, a lot of uh, universities are still test optional, but for PhD, they're making it very competitive. G GPA, as we discussed earlier, GPA is there's no specific GPA requirement. You don't have to have a 3.8 to get into a PhD program. But when you just need to know when you're applying for, G uh, for PhD in the United States, there is a committee who's reviewing your application. It's just not the advisor. It's just it, the whole committee is composed of faculty members, the deans, and the advisors. And the end admissions officer, and they all are reviewing your applications. So the, at the GPA level, they're looking at how you performed at your undergraduate level and how you performed in your master's level. And the decision will be made based on that. Application fees. So when it comes to application fees, PhD has really high application fees. Uh, the highest I have seen is $200. And Schools keep these fees high because they want to know if the applicant is really serious because they're spending their time to review the applications. Um, application fee waivers for PhD programs, um, there might be some for very few universities, and even if they have it, it was very rare. So as I mentioned before, before about faculty members, it is very important for you to know who the faculty is because um, faculty is someone you are going to be working with. This is, some, this is going to be your supervisor, just treat it as a job, like they're going to always see you. You wouldn't be able to graduate if the faculty member doesn't approve it with the program director that yes, you have successfully completed everything and you're ready to graduate and get your degree. Also, if when you're applying for PhD schools and you really like a school, make sure you uh, research about these faculty and the content they have published so that you can write their research in your statement of purpose so that it can relate to the school and it makes it easy for you to get into 
the graduate school, which is your PhD. Lastly, interviews. Um, yes, before COVID, they were interviewing a lot of candidates when they were applying for a PhD. When COVID hit, they were waiving these interview, uh, interview requirements. But now they are reverting it back. If they are really wanting to know more about the applicant, they're going to do a phone call interview and later invite you in person. Scholarships. <clears throat> so there are many scholarships available in the United States. They can be different types, independent scholarships, cultural scholarships, and merit-based scholarships. Independent scholarship is not offered by school. It's offered by different organizations. You can look up the school's website under their financial aid, what type of independent scholarships they have. Cultural scholarships, most of the schools would offer international students $500, $1,000, and $1,500 or even more. And in return, they would ask you to contribute at their international festival and you showcase your country. In your case, it would be Pakistan. <clears throat> and then we have Fulbright Scholarship, which is a fully funded scholarship for graduate students. Your who are trying to pursue master's or PhD. Fulbright scholarship is offered by United States Education Foundation in Pakistan, and there are some requirements to that application. The applications are currently open right now, and the deadline is April 12th. One of the key components of that application is that you have to take GRE and then apply for it. So here are some tips in general when you're applying or researching for graduate schools in the United States. If you are really concerned about your major and how the outcome is going to be, talk to, you, to people in the industry. This is what I did when I was going for my major, I spoke to people in the industry and what they're doing now. Reach out to faculty. The best way to reaching out to the faculty in the university is by reaching out to them through LinkedIn. It's a professional platform where you can reach out to the professionals and they will respond to you and they will guide you. And they're more than happy to guide you because people, faculty in the US want their students to be successful. And then one of the most important thing is build your resume because when you're applying for PhD or master's level, they are going to ask for your resume. So you can attend some workshops. We, Education USA do have some workshops um, talking about resume start and then start your research early don't wait for the last minute don't wait until one month before the semester starts it takes a lot there's a lot of things you need to know before you even can apply and then avail the internship opportunities if you don't have any work experience your internship opportunity your internship experience would count as a work experience in the united states it doesn't matter if it was paid or unpaid and if you really want to dig deeper in, into the content of what the outcome is after you graduate, you can get in touch with the alum, alumni of, of those programs. And then understand the culture because you, most of the students who go to United States do, do suffer cultural shock. So you just need to make sure what are the difference and just know the vocabulary. And lastly, just do your own research because we can attend as many webinars or sessions as we want, but we only learn better if we do our own research. Here is our link. If you want to speak to us, you are more than welcome to sign up for our advising services. It is free services that we offer. Once you sign up, your advisor will get in touch with you and you guys can schedule a session. You can also follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram to get updated on our latest events. So now you can drop your questions on the chat box and we can answer them. So there is a question, what are some of the best programs in university teaching chemical process equipment design? So there are over 4,000 universities and they all are unique in their own way. We would say you can use our resources such as gradschool.com, masterslevel.com, and Google would be your best friend. 
there's a question can someone apply for a scholarship and fellowship program both at a single in single time i am assuming you're trying to apply for a phd level so fellowship if you apply for fellowship for a phd level it is pretty much going to cover your whole phd degree there in some instances you might just have to contribute thousand or two thousand dollars but usually fellowship is completely covered There is another question. Hi, sir. Can we get any type of scholarship after acceptance from a university in a master's program? Yes, you can get any type of scholarships. Just make sure that those scholarships are transferred to your college. Yes. Um, someone said, I want to apply in master's in physical therapy. Yes, you're, you can sign up for our advising services and we can guide you through that. So there's a student who is saying that I am a current student of MPhil Pharmacology. So you can actually sign up for our advising services and we can guide you accordingly because we have to know more details about, about your publications and stuff like that. Uh, student, one of the students is asking, can a student change his field of or master's if you want to change his field? So this, this becomes very tricky and depends on school to school. And for this, I would say, if you're trying to change your field, you would have to convince them, why are you trying to change your field? Here's a question, if GRE is required for all universities, so it depends on university, university to university because a lot of schools are still test optional. So you would just have to research. So there is a question about uh, credentials evaluation. Most of the universities would require you to have your degrees credentials evaluated. One tip I would give you, this is something, this is coming from a professional experience and personal experience. What happened to me is that when they asked me for my high school grades, I did general analysis, but they're looking for a course by course uh, evaluation. So just make sure that you do course by course evaluation because you don't want to do a wrong evaluation and they ask for another one and they all cost you is more than hundred dollars. Uh, there is a question that someone has a master's degree in English language and they're trying to get master's in the US on a fully funded scholarship. So you can look into our uh, Fulbright scholarships option that's fully funded. Another question is what's the average application fee for the graduate school? So it this varies school to school, but typically it is between 80 to $90. There is a question, will you guide how to approach professors for grant? Sorry, where did it go? Will you guide how to approach professors for grants as research assistant? So when I'm assuming you're asking about master's level, so you don't have to approach the professors in this, you just have to look up on department you just need to reach out to the department like let's say you're getting into business you just need to reach out to the business department and see if they have any openings available most of the universities waive off tuition fee and offer a stipend to phd candidates upon admission but is it too competitive to get in? Yes, it's highly competitive to get into PhD schools. Let me give you an example of one school, their requirement, they, I think thousand students apply for their PhD program and they only admit those, they only admit 30 students in their school. 
um, people below 3.0 CGPA have a chance to get admission in public or private universities. So it just depends how low your GPA is. I would recommend you sign up for our services and we can look more into your GPA and guide you better. So someone said, please suggest schools and programs where people with CGPA less than three can apply. We can provide you with resources. The best thing I can advise you right now is to reach out to us and then we can give you resources via email and then you can start doing your research. So there is a question, sorry. Is there any other scholarship other than Fulbright? If you're asking about fully funded, there, there you would have to see which school you're applying at. There are some schools who offer fully funded scholarships. You can look into those. What GPA is required for admissions and master programs typically is 3.0. So there is a question, could you please guide on university shortlisting for PhD admissions? If one is expecting full funding for PhD, what factors do they need to consider? I would recommend signing up for our advisement services and making an appointment with me and we can guide you one-on-one. -on -one. So there is a question, when should I give GRE? I'm graduating this summer. I need to apply for a master's. Should I start preparing? Yes, you need to start preparing for your GRE now and try to give your GRE. And it also depends when are you trying to apply. If you're trying to apply for fall this semester, I would believe it's a little too late. If you're trying to apply for spring next semester, I think you can start working on preparing and giving your GRE in the next couple of months. All, there's a question, all US university requires GRE and TOEFL. It depends on university to university. A lot of universities have gone test optional after COVID. How to find, there's a question, how to find assistantship and fellowships. So what you would have to do is when you're, you would need to go on the university's website and then see what your major is. Let's say you're doing business, you would need to reach out to School of Business. If you're trying to do, if your major is computer science then you would have to reach out to the computer science department and they will let you know also their their assistantships is also posted on their career services. So there's a question, where can we apply for internships? Also want to know that these internships are paid or not. So the best way to apply for internships would be reaching out to the career services at each schools, and then they will let you know what is available and if it's paid or not, it, they have both uh, e either paid or you don't get paid. So they have both options available. So there is a question, can I still apply for masters with 2.9 GPA and bachelors and a good GMAT score? I think you can make an appointment with me and we can, I would need more information from you and I can guide you better. Uh, there is a student who's saying, I'm an undergrad student of computer science. How can I start my personal research? 
and make a contribution to research papers. So if you're asking about how to start your research in terms of looking up for the universities, um, you can look you can look at look them up on College Board, and then you can put in the field, look, put in your requirements what you're looking for in the U.S. university schools, and it will filter it out based on that. So we already discussed the average application fee, which would be between eighty to ninety dollars. So there's a question, is it a good thing to take 80% loan for, from them for studies? So taking out a loan is going to be something personal decision you would have to take because it's a loan, it's not a grant. So you would have to pay this loan back and you would have to see how much interest rate you would be paying on it and what is the time frame you have to pay your loan back. Another question is, what is the age limit for applying for the PhD? There's no age limit for applying for any kind of coursework in the United States. You can be of any age. Another question is people having GPA below 3.0, what are the chances for them? Again, this depends on school to school. If your GP, GPA is below 3.0, then please make an appointment with us. We can discuss more options based upon your academic performance. So there's a question, should we focus our att attention on one major only, or can I apply for two different majors for masters? For example, I'm interested in both counseling psychology and neuroscience. This is a very good question. So if you're interested in two different things at a master's level, you're more than welcome to do a major in something you really are confident and minor in something you just want to have it in the back of your hand. Just keep in mind that they're not there are not many universities that offer major and minor options for international students. And the universities who are offering major and minor options are highly competitive in this sector. And uh, for getting a minor in something, let's say you were doing psychology and, and neuroscience, you would just have to take five additional classes in your minor, or maybe more, it just depends on the school, but it's highly competitive. So you do a dissertation at your PhD level. So there is a question, does the choice of supervisor program and university for PhD affect the chances of the US visa? Um, they, no, you, they recognize all the universities. However, the, US, the visa officer is probably going to ask for your faculty's resume or CV. And they would want to dig deep and find out if you have done your research on that particular faculty member that you will be working under. So there's a question, how do I decide what my target and safety schools should be? How can I ensure I'm not in too high? That's a very good question. So your target schools are like after dream schools are your target school. Uh, as I said, Harvard could be your dream school and MIT could be your target school, or let's say Columbia could be your safety school. So this is probably how you can shortlist them. And if you need further assistance, I recommend making an appointment with us and we can help you guide better. What is the acceptance ratio in graduate schools in the USA for a second master's? So this depends on what type of master's you have and what are you trying to get your master's in. And as an international student, they would really, they will be interested to know why are you trying to go for a second master's? Like what is the main reason behind it? Let's say if you had an MBA in management and you're trying to go for MBA in marketing, they would really want to know what is the reason because they're still in the same field. There's a question, how can we later get advising from your advising services? You can sign up on our website, educationusa.edu. 
dot pk. So you can sign up on our website, educationusa.pk forward slash register. And I will, I can include the link on our chat box. The link has actually been included in the chat box, actually. So this is a slide where you can access our advising services. So there is a question, what are the key differences in public and private universities in terms of student experience? So public universities, as I mentioned, they're large in sizes and private is a little smaller. Uh, in private universities, the student to professor ratio is much smaller, so they're much accessible. In public, you would have to make an appointment. Of course, in private, you would have to make an appointment with the professors, but in public, it's a little hard to get all the professors. And um, again, they're not gener as they're not as generous in funding as private are. So there is another question about age limit for scholarship for PhD. They're not going to look at your age limit when you're applying for scholarships. So, uh, for Amir Muhammad Khan, I would recommend to sign up for our advising services and we can help you guide better. So there's a question, are there deadlines for fall admissions? Yes, there are deadlines for each individual terms in the US. So about GRE, so the minimum score that you have to get on each section is 145 for the Fulbright. Um, there's, can you tell us briefly about sending emails to supervisors? Um, are you, do you mean the faculty members? If you are trying to reach out to the faculty members, then I would say LinkedIn is something you can reach out to them. And then there is a question, do you, we have any WhatsApp group? No, we don't, but you're more than welcome to send us messages on our app. There is no age limit for master's degree. So there is a question, what are the basic things in CV for USA? Should we use photo and other personal details? No, please don't use any photos or personal details. They're, they're, not, going, they're not interested to know your age and where you live and stuff like that. And they don't, want, they don't necessarily want photos as well. What is the average PhD funding and is it enough? So this depends, this, is, this varies major to major and different universities as well. Can you work part-time during master's of computer science? Yes, you can work part-time on an F1 visa. However, it has to be on your campus. It can, you cannot work off campus. For... But there is a question when granting scholarships to master's students, what criteria do they typically consider? They're going to consider your GPA, of course, and they're going to see how well you performed in your undergraduate degree. And then they're going to look at your work experience depending on your major, stuff like that. I'm 
I'm you're saying I'm scheduled to complete my degree by September. Should I wait until then to start applying for scholarships or is it advisable to begin the process now? Have you been accepted in a university? If you have been accepted at the university, you just need to look at what are the scholarship deadlines. I would recommend to get in touch with us so that I can get more information from you and guide you better. Also, if you are completing your degree in Pakistan by September, then it's this is a good time to start researching your options. There is a question, will you help us to write statement of purpose? So there is actually an event scheduled for the next month, which is going to focus on statement of purpose. Also, yes, we do help students give feed, we provide feedback once you have written your statement of purpose. However, we're, we're going to resume doing that after the Fulbright scholarship application has been closed, which is after April 12th. So there's a question, is there any chance for disabled can get scholarship in USA? Of course, yes, you can. And Fulbright is one of your options. Again, for the GRE score for your Fulbright scholarship, your minimum score in each content should be, each section should be 145. How can you make your application stand out when applying for masters? Uh, there are many ways. You can take the testing, you can do take different types of tests, you can have recommendation letters, you can have uh, a resume well designed, well written. The question is do we have to take GRE or GMAT for masters in business? So, Mariam, you would have to check what exactly the university is asking for. Daha Rashid is asking, what are some tips to pre best present your authentic story, particularly in terms of presenting your experience from your CV as well as your education onto your essays? Sometimes I feel my experiences are all over the place. Okay, so Thaha, I would say reach out to us and we can help you out. But of course, after April 12th. Okay. Also, we have a lot of prior recorded sessions for statement of purpose and resume writing on our Facebook page. So you're more than welcome to watch that as well. Do we have any charges for one-on-one -on -one advising services? If you are referring to Education USA, no, it's free of uh, charge, it's free. There's another question, can we prepare for GRE in one month? Again, everyone has different learning styles and how fast you learn. So this is something um, that depends on person to person. For, 20, for 2024 for fall intake, how earlier should I start preparing for it? I think this is a good time. You can start doing your research. How can we check university degree is worth it? You can look at their link. You can look at, you can reach out to the faculty. You can reach out to the alumni as well.
Here's a question. Is research proposal compulsory for PhD to apply in the US? It's a very good question. It just depends on school to school, but typically, no, not a lot of schools are expecting you to give a research proposal, but they want to know what is your research going to be in. Again, guys, age is not going to affect in your admissions, your scholarship applications in the United States. You're not going to get denied just because of your age. So there are a lot of questions about, about how to register for our services and how to make an appointment with us. So the slide right now, which is presented in front of you, has our website. So you can read, you can get on that website and sign up for our services. And the assigned advisor will reach out to you and you can make an appointment and have one-on-one -on -one session with them. So here is a question, is there any alternative to GRE? Which universities offer a GRE waiver? At master's level, there are a lot of universities that are test optional, so you just have to research. So I'll be taking a last question. The last question, I'm taking is how can we get in contact with alumni of universities? A lot of universities have on their page, which is, it says alumni services, just get on to that page and there should be an email address or there should be a sign up link where you can sign up and someone from alumni services or career services will reach out to you and address your concerns. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. I hope this session was informative to you. If you have any questions, you can send us an email listed on the screen. Also, if you need a free advising services, you're more than welcome to sign up on the link that is mentioned. And once you register, an advisor will be in touch with you. Thank you so much. You all have a good day.